that's a, a dear friend and, and also a distinguished professor up at uh, Carlisle at the U.S. Army War College. But his connections go wide and far to uh, many different pieces that he touches national security, uh, both within the government and, and without. Uh, a multi-talented individual who I've learned a lot from. So, Jeff, I'm going to turn it to you to introduce your panel. Well, Art, thank you very much for those very, very kind words. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a real pleasure for me to uh, be back here at the Naval Academy with many uh, old friends. I, I treasure uh, one of the things that I do is I am a senior fellow at the Stockdale Center of Ethical Leadership here at the Naval Academy, though sadly I don't get as many opportunities to come down here as I would like. Uh, as Art said, I currently hold a position at the Army War College. Uh, and also, like the first gentleman I'm going to introduce, I'm a fellow at the Carnegie Council for Ethics and International Affairs in New York. So let me just go ahead and, because and, uh, you, you don't want to listen to me, you want to listen to the panel. And let me go ahead and introduce this, uh, our first speaker for this very distinguished panel on the questions of preventive and preemptive war. And that is, of course, David Roden. David Roden is a senior fellow at the University of Oxford, where he co-directs the Oxford, Oxford Institute for Ethics, Law, and Armed Conflict, and is a senior fellow as well, as head for the Carnegie Council for Ethics and International Affairs in New York. He's obviously totally qualified to be a member of this panel based on his publications, which include preemption, just and unjust warriors, and war and self-defense. He is also, of course, a graduate of Oxford University, a Rhodes Scholar from New Zealand, and spent time as a senior research fellow at the Australian National University. In addition to his duties at Oxford University, David also obviously has a direct impact on policy, how we translate these amazing ideas into policy. As he's busy uh, teaching and as a regular lecturer at the United Kingdom's Joint Service and Command and Staff College, where he provides ethical training for senior military officers up to the rank of Major General. So with that in mind, David, I will turn the floor over to you. Well, thanks so much, Jeff. Um, is that on? Can you hear me? Uh, well, it's a real pleasure to be here um, in this uh, very distinguished and august gathering, including with so many uh, really good friends and colleagues. So thank you very much to the organizers for uh, inviting me. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the idea of preventive military action. Uh, and like Jean's remarks, I'm going to draw a distinction between preemption, which I'm understanding is military action against a threat that is imminent, as for example in Israel 1967. So preemption on the one hand and preventive action, uh, which is action against a threat that is not imminent, which is distant or not yet fully formed. And, and like Jean, we can think about that with reference to uh, George Bush's 2002 national security strategy, which said that there was um, a right or a readiness to fight preventive action uh, against, and I quote here, emerging threats before they're fully formed. Now, I want to suggest that there are, there are very, very strong moral reasons for not endorsing uh, a doctrine that would allow preventive action, action against a threat that is not imminent but that is emerging in that way. Uh, but unlike Gene's remarks, I'm, I'm not going to focus on the status of rights and the, uh, sorry, the status of um, the rights of states, and in particular ideas of state sovereignty. What I want to look at is the effects of preventive war on individual persons. Now, there are, again, there are a couple of ways that you can understand that. So one of the ways that people have uh, historically often thought about preventive action is in terms of consequences, of a kind of utilitarian analysis. So on the one hand, you balance the idea that preventive action uh, might be very efficient in welfare terms. You might be able to stop a threat before it becomes so big that you'd have to have a tremendously destructive war in order to, uh, in order to stop it. But balanced against that, of course, um, are a whole series of so-called rule utilitarian or rule consequentialist reasons. So people have thought, well, if we had a rule, like you find in the, in the national security strategy, allowing preventive action, that might be a charter for destabilization in many areas of the world where you have states that, that kind of have reasonable uh, fears of each other. You think about India, Pakistan, North and South Korea. Uh, a number of people have commented that under the Bush Doctrine, uh, the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor probably would have been um, a permissible act of preventive action. So there are a whole series of issues around that, but that's not the series of issues that I really want to talk about either. What I want to talk about is what are the requirements for being liable to have force used against you? So the background assumption that I'm starting with is that ordinary human beings have rights against being attacked and, and killed. 
and it can only be permissible to attack and kill them if they have themselves done something to make them liable to be treated in that way. Um, you don't lose that right simply because it is useful or important uh, in, in order to, to, um, to, to attack you in that way. You can only lose these rights against being attacked by doing something uh, that makes you liable to be attacked in that way. So I wanna, I'm taking it as a starting point that a, that a military action, a war, can only be justifiable if the people that you are attacking, that you're directing force against, have done something to make themselves liable in that way. And the problem, of course, arises because in, in ordinary context of thinking about, for example, liability and self-defense, you become liable when you have engaged in a wrongful attack or wrongful act of aggression against someone else. You don't normally become liable to attack because you will engage in a wrongful aggression at some point in the future. So let me give you a, a kind of rather contrived philosophical um, uh, case that's meant to kind of get us to reflect on, on this idea. So imagine that, um, imagine that I was observing um, a, a friend or a colleague of mine reading through some of his personal letters. I'm observing him through um, a, a long range uh, telescope. And I can see that he's reading through these letters and in that pile of letters, I know there's a letter from me proving that I've been unfaithful with his wife. Right? And I know this guy, right? I know that if once he reads that letter, he will get uh, inevitably, he will, he will um, form and then act upon a murderous intention to kill me, right? So I know as soon as he reads these papers, he's going to, um, he's going to, uh, he's going to uh, want to kill me and he will in fact take steps to, to wrongfully kill me. Now let's say that I have a you know, high powered rifle and I could take him out prior to his reading those letters. Now presumably we have a very, very strong intuition that even if we, even if we accept that we can know with 99% accuracy that he will in fact engage in a wrongful attack against me as soon as he reads that letter, we, we can't do that until he has actually done something. He's crossed a certain threshold of wrongful action. Um, there was also there was a movie a couple of years back, Minority Report with Tom Cruise, very, very similar idea, right? You imagine that we can know infallibly in the future that somebody will commit a crime, still there's a very strong sense in which you don't become liable to punishment or defensive uh, um, violence until you have crossed the threshold of actually doing, uh, doing something wrongful um, in order to, to assume that kind of liability. So here, of course, is the problem with preventive military action. In preventive military action, we're using force against people who we believe will undertake a wrongful act of aggression at some time in the future, but haven't yet done that. So they seem analogous to the person reading the letters or the people who will commit crimes in minority report. <coughs> now, of course, there is a response to that, that kind of that argument or those set of thoughts, and that is to say, well, look, Engaging in an act of aggression is not the only kind of wrongful action that could potentially make you liable to defensive force. We also have the idea of engaging in a wrongful conspiracy to undertake um, um, uh, aggressive or, or criminal action. We have this concept very strongly worked out within criminal law, for example. And you know, as with so many things in the ethics of war, uh, we find this idea most beautifully and eloquently formulated by, by Michael Waltzer. So I'll, I'll read out the way that, that Michael Waltzer has of thinking about this. This is extremely helpful. So what Michael says is the line between legitimate and illegitimate first strike is not going to be drawn at the point of imminent attack, but at the point of sufficient threat. And interestingly, that language of sufficient threat is used in the Bush um, national se security strategy, whether, uh, whether consciously or unconsciously, I don't know, it might just be a, a, um, a consequence of the way that Michael's ways of thinking and writing have permeated all of our ways of thinking. But he says, the line won't be drawn at the point of imminent attack, but at the point of sufficient threat. That phrase, he says, is necessarily vague. I mean it to cover three things. A manifest intent to injure, a degree of active preparation that makes that intent a positive danger, and a general situation in which waiting or doing anything other than fighting greatly magnifies the risk. So here we have a conception which says, well, you can become liable to, um, to attack, not only when you are imminently about to engage in an act of aggression, but when you have uh, undertaken this kind of active preparation, this conspiratorial preparation for attack. Now that, that seems like a pretty um, plausible way of solving this conundrum, but I wanna, I wanna suggest that, that it has a very, very paradoxical conclusion or implication. Because the problem is that, as we all know, um, 
soldiers don't just undertake actions. Um, they always plan for those actions, right? So any military organization will undertake planning and will specifically develop doctrines of action. So if a military like the United States military is going to undertake preemptive or preventive action, then it will generate doctrine in order to allow them to do that. At the highest level, the national security strategy can be seen as exactly that kind of doctrine. Now, what I want to suggest is that this idea that engaging in a conspiracy to attack is a sufficient condition for being liable to, um, uh, to preventive action uh, in, uh, generates this, the, the, the following paradox. And I'm going to read this out because it's a little bit, it's a little bit complicated. Right? So I think everything here hinges on whether engaging in a conspiracy to attack is itself a wrongful act that is sufficient to ground rights of preventive action. So remember that as, as Michael construes it, this has at least two elements. There has to be a manifest intent to injure, first, and secondly, there has to be a level of active preparation. But, and here's the problem, these two elements precisely describe any articulated doctrine of prevention, such as, for example, you find in the 2002 National Security Strategy. So that doctrine quite explicitly affirms both the intention to attack, so it says the United States will, if necessary, act preemptively, and it also articulates active preparations for doing so. It says to support preemptive options, we will build better, more integrated intelligence capabilities, coordinate closely with allies, transform our military forces. So if a conspiracy to attack consisting in manifest intent and active preparation is a form of wrongdoing sufficient to ground preventive military action, then it looks like doctrines of prevention, such as we find in the national security strategy, are ipso facto morally wrong. So the paradox, I think, here, we can see it emerging quite clearly. If manifest intent and active preparation together constitute a wrong that's sufficient to ground preventive military action, then any doctrine of preventive war looks like it's going to be impermissible. If, on the other hand, doctrines of prevention are permissible, then the combination of manifest intent and active preparation are presumably not in themselves wrong. And that seems to imply that there is no sufficient moral ground for engaging in preventive action. So the paradox looks similar in structure to the famous liars paradox, which consists in a statement that is true if it is false and false if it is true. On the conspiracy account, if preventive wars are permissible, then doctrines of preventive war, such as the national security strategy, are impermissible. If doctrines of preventive war are permissible, then preventive wars themselves are impermissible. So I think this is a, a really, really tricky paradox that really undermines this idea that not only an active threat of aggression, but um, a, a, cons a, a conspiracy um, to, uh, to engage in future aggression can be uh, a sufficient cause for preventive action. Now, just very briefly, I've probably got a few minutes left. Um, uh, let, let, me, let me just indicate kind of one further twist on, on, this, um, on, this, uh, on this argument. Because one thing you might say about the argument is, well, it's all, very, it's all kind of very nice and very clever, um, but what it misses out is that there are important differences in the way that organizations can um, plan for future military action, can undertake what I described as a, a conspiracy for future action. And in particular, you need to distinguish between um, a contingent and a non-contingent form of military planning. So the thought might be this. Conspiracy to undertake future military action, consisting in manifest intent and active preparation, is only morally objectionable if, it, um, if, it ha if it's, if it's non-contingent in its form. In other words, uh, but, but, it, but, it's, but it can be entirely acceptable when it has a contingent form, right? So in other words, when, when we say, well, we are planning to attack them preemptively, but only because they were planning to attack us, right? So you draw a distinction between contingent forms of conspiracy to attack and non-contingent forms. And so then you might say, well, contingent forms like the national security strategy